Welcome everyone uh, to the National Institute of Mental Health Directors Innovation Speaker Series. I'm really pleased to have with us today, Dr. Joshua Denny, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Institute of Health's All of Us Research Program to talk about that program and what it offers for precision medicine. Before uh, we hear from uh, Dr. Denny, and let's just go over some the usual housekeeping notes. Please, if you require technical assistance, use the Q&A box to communicate with the event production staff and they'll do their best to help you. At any time during the webinar, you can enter any questions or comments you might have into that Q&A box. We're gonna, uh, Josh and I are, are gonna engage in a fireside chat of sorts, no fire, but well, the internet I suppose serves as that. Um, but uh, we'll sprinkle your questions in throughout our conversation. So feel free um, to enter them at any point in time. And I'll do my best to uh, introduce those questions in our conversation as we go along. And then the third point is that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available in the coming weeks on our website, nimh.nih.gov. And uh, I encourage you, if you enjoy today's session and think you know somebody who'd like to learn more about it, um, to point them to the recording so that they can, they can enjoy uh, in, 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 uh, at their op next opportunity. With that, I'm going to take, uh, I'm actually going to give Josh a chance to introduce himself, but uh, Josh Denny is the Chief Executive Officer, as I noted, of the National Institute of Health's All of Us Research Program. And Josh, feel free to introduce yourself in any way you see fit, uh, though it's, of course, always nice for us to hear about how our colleagues have gotten to the point where they are and, uh, and what they like about what they're doing. But go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, Josh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this fireside chat with you. And I certainly excited to engage in your audience and um, uh, you know take some questions through this time. And I welcome the opportunity to introduce myself in a you know a less formal capacity. So I am an internist and informatician by training. I uh, did actually all of my training at Vanderbilt. Um, from uh, you know medical school residency fellowship in informatics, and um, you know I got started doing stuff on medical education actually and processing large corpus of medical documents and doing uh, natural language processing on those uh, education documents as a source of information and that worked found its way into medical records and after using uh, this with medical records uh, started with looking at genomics. And that just found its way into large scale uh, biobanks and um, the opportunity to engage in, um, you know, this, what became known as the All of Us Research Program, starting uh, really as just a concept in late 2014. And then the president's uh, announcement in 2015 at the time of this precision medicine initiative. Um, and then I've been involved with it ever since. And it's been just an incredible, uh, exciting ride through that time period. I'm a dad of, of four kids as well. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, that means soccer games and football games and, and uh, you know, uh, ballerina. I want to be a six-year-old at this point. Um, and, uh, but, but I think uh, even, even your Google calendar is big data, huh? So even my Google calendar gets uh, big data and we all get all hours of the day. That's right. So anyway, it's a real pleasure to talk to you about um, uh, the All of Us Research Program and how... Uh, learn from your audience and uh, also engage on how it can help advance mental health amongst other topics. Well, great, Josh. And uh, we'll get into that then right away. Although I might come back to some of this, some of the details of the origin story it always intrigues me why, uh, why and how doctors uh, end up being informaticians. Uh, and actually what an informatician means sounds a little bit like magician. So we'll figure that out. Before I let my dog out, I'm going to just ask you the question, which I know you're prepared for. Just really tell us about the All of Us program. Many people on the call probably know what it's about, but many don't. So if you could just give us a general introduction. I know you have some slides to share too. Great. Thanks, Josh. Yes, I will share my screen and just go through some introductory slides uh, of the All of Us research program. And, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a real, our real goal is writ large and across really all diseases and health statuses 
to make precision medicine a reality for all of everyone. Um, and uh, this is our mission statement to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. And that really, those words are intentionally chosen as really with all mission statements, but to really hone in on that first branch here of you know, nurturing partnerships uh, for decades with at least a million participants who reflect the diversity of the United States. It's a real strength of our country, um, is, is its diversity. It's something that's not been well um, represented in most of our research studies. And uh, we really wanted to partner with our participants, which means things like returning value to them, which is in some cases information, but it also means you know doing research that matters um, and delivering real change and how we can be a positive catalyst for change in the research community. Um, and uh, we want this program to last for a long time, decades, um, and really deliver to as many researchers as possible a large, rich biomedical data set. We are a platform that others come in and do research on, and we need uh, those of you in the audience to come in and do work and make discoveries. So um, we launched nationally in 20, uh, 2018. We've since enrolled uh, to four, over 400, 540,000 participants have consented. People can participate in different ways, but regardless of how they come into the system, they share the same kinds of information and share uh, and, and sign the same consents. And right now we have over 400,000 considered uh, contributed biospecimens. You can see that like all systems that had a significant in-person component, which we did at the time, COVID-19 um, hit us hard and we had to pause all those in-person activities and we used that to make ourselves stronger. We've launched with uh, now a real ability to reach all 50 states and US territories through things like saliva kits, more national partners, safer ways to engage, uh, really can get biospecimens everywhere now. Um, and uh, of course have restarted our in-person activities as well. This gives you a sense of our distribution. We uh, have all 50 states and US territories represented. We have more representation where we have large medical centers that are recruiting through brick and mortar. And like I said, we really focus on diversity. 50% of those uh, contributing biospecimens are diverse by race and ethnicity. Um, over 80% are diverse by this larger measure of underrepresentation in biomedical research. And you can see those categories on the bottom right. It has to do with age, uh, race, and ethnicity. Uh, gender, sexual gender minorities, um, educational and attainment, income, uh, rural location. Uh, we recently added disability to that metric and our participants are engaged in an ongoing way. So we did things like send an update, cert, updated survey to them to assess disability because you know those weren't questions we necessarily that we asked at the very beginning of the program. And that's a theme. We continue to ask questions as things go on um, uh, of our participants. These are the five major data streams. Uh, it starts with consent, and a key part of that is a authorization for sharing electronic health records. It becomes a really powerful measure of, of someone's health trajectory and gets a lot of data for without them having to provide it to us on their behalf. Uh, we have sets of surveys at launch, and then we typically release about a new survey each year. We did some during COVID, for instance, uh, that were repeated measures. We have different kinds of surveys across this measure. We have a brief set of physical measurements and during in-person visits. We collect uh, uh, DNA, plasma, serum, cell-free DNA, RNA, and urine. Um, and we uh, have ways people can donate Fitbit or other uh, mobile uh, wearable technologies through things like Apple Health Kit um, uh, into the resource. And we're also doing a pilot where we're giving out Fitbit devices to uh, uh, individuals as well. This gives you a sense of the data we have. And, you know, I mentioned the capture of electronic health records. And one of the real powers there is we have a lot of longitudinal information. In some cases, we have up to 40 years of information on people that they have shared with us. That means even though we enroll only adults over 18 at the current time, we're going to be expanding soon to pediatrics. Um, uh, you know, we have 20,000 virtual kids that have shared data in some cases, even to birth um, uh, from their uh, extant electronic health records. And you can see we have about 13,000 Fitbit records all we are already available in that data set. Um, lots of other kinds of information, about half a billion uh, information points uh, if you exclude Fitbit. And you can see Fitbit's already in the billions uh, of inf information points we have on our individuals that they've shared with us. 
And then we're really excited that we've recently launched our genetic information. Our first release of genomic information came out in March. It includes about 100,000 whole genome sequences, uh, just like you know uh, our whole cohort. That's about 50% diverse by race and ethnicity, um, 165,000 arrays. You know, if you really think about the diversity of this data set and the size of this data set, um, uh, you, you can see that when the number of variants we've observed. So about 600 million unique variants, um, 400 million of those uh, are not in NOMAD, which is a common aggregation service of a lot of these variants. 100 million of those variants occur three or, in three or more of our participants. So, you know, they're not super rare. I mean, they're, they're very rare, but they haven't been observed yet. And so this is a really new uh, contribution I think we can provide. And since these information, these people also have other kinds of information like electronic health records, surveys, Fitbit, et cetera, you know, uh, start to interrogate what these variants actually mean to provide some knowledge and, uh, you know, which ones are likely benign, which one, which will be most of them, of course, which ones might have health effects. And uh, this just gives you a sense of where we are compared to all global GWASs. Probably a lot of you know this data, but you know, 96% uh, of all you know, genome-wide association studies have been on people of European ancestry. So you can see our data are dramatically different than that. And even amongst those who are European ancestry, you know, uh, uh, you know, about 60% of them are underrepresented with another characteristic that I mentioned before. Uh, these data are available to researchers now. You can explore them, you know, kind of in real time uh, through a public data browser. You don't need a login. You can get senses of what the data look like from, you know, uh, given diagnoses across our EHR information, what those distributions look like, some very simple cross-type information and give you a sense of whether or not we have, you know, counts that are likely to support a research study that you might want to do uh, in those kinds of data. You can also explore the genetic variants um, uh, in there as well. And then if you want to go do research and do a study, you come in through the researcher workbench. This gives you access to row level uh, data on individual participants to do studies. It's uh, a centralized cloud resource. We operate under a, what we call a passport access model. So that means you come in and uh, just describe your workspace. Uh, it's a central non-human subjects research IRB approval. So you describe what you do, that description becomes, uh, parts of it become public. Um, uh, part, there, it's available for us to review as well. And there's a resource access board that uh, passively and then subset actively review some of these. Um, and, uh, and But once you create that description and say what you're gonna do, you can get started doing work immediately. Um, it's currently open to U.S. nonprofits, academic institutions, and healthcare organizations. We have uh, actually about 3,500 researchers using it now from over 400 institutions across the U.S. Um, uh, more than 20% of those represent uh, your kind of uh, patient uh, advocacy nonprofits or minority-serving institutions including uh, HBCUs is a particular focus. Um, and in, in this resource, uh, come in and um, uh, of note, if you're one of those 400 institutions that have signed a master agreement, uh, a new researcher can come on from that institution. And from the first time they sign up to the website, you know, enter in and create an account to start doing work can be as little as two hours. Uh, you can complete all those registration steps and actually de define your first workspace and start doing it, building a cohort, start doing an analysis in under two hours, um, which we think is uh, a really exciting advance of where we are uh, with other, other cohorts. I want to mention a little bit about the return of information as a cornerstone of what we wanted to do, and participants told us what they were most interested in was getting health-related genetic results. We've already been releasing other kinds of information to them, um, some survey results and how that compares to others, uh, genetic ancestry and some non-health-related traits, but you know we're really close to launching at a, a national way. Um, uh, health-related genetic results, and the two things we're returning are hereditary disease risk, which follows the so-called ACMG 59, inherited cancer syndromes, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and then um, uh, pharmacogenomics, which you call medicine in your DNA. Um, those results uh, are uh, follow a, a rigorous pathway. We have an FDA investigational device exemption, and these results are all supported by genetic counselors. Um, we actually uh, will also um, provide for clinical results 
off of the hereditary disease risk reports if someone has an actionable um, a variant. And you know, uh, as we think about diverse audiences and reaching them, everything uh, across the interfaces is, is in English and Spanish. And then um, we also uh, have language line support for more than 200 languages um, uh, in this genetic counseling support. And this just gives you a sense of what some of those reports look like across uh, pharmacogenetics and health related results. Uh, these are available to take to your provider and provider friendly formats as well. And so I just want to give uh, uh, just one example of the many research studies. There's 26 or 100 or so research projects that have been started on the platform already. Um, and this is one example of uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, what could be different in uh, terms of treatment for people diagnosed with depression. So in this analysis, um, uh, it started with people diagnosed with depression and looked at common medications used to treat depression and then simply divided it by those who self-identified as white versus non-white in an earlier release of the data set. This was in what we called a demonstration project, so it wasn't actually designed to like necessarily find something new. But what it did find is, uh, as you can see, you know, there's a different sequencing of medications uh, in terms of frequency and what the first medication was versus the second medication someone would start based on these two populations. Um, and you know, some of this could be driven by all sorts of things. This could be driven by disparities like insurance status, it could be driven by regions of the country, uh, it could be driven by things like pharmacogenomics and what actually works for participants um, and you know potential side effects people have had. We don't know the answer to that. And uh, this, like many other resources, because this is a demonstration project, you can actually go, if you're an approved researcher, grab the workspace and get you know the code that generates these things and you know, go investigate it more deeply. Um, uh, and you can generate all sorts of kinds of analyses like this. And people have been doing analyses looking at you know, mental health and suicide risk, uh, and suicidality, uh, for instance, during COPE and how that was affected by discrimination, um, uh, which are some of the surveys that we did and launched during COVID. So there's lots of things out there. Um, uh, and just to give you a sense of what some of those studies look like. And then I just wanted to mention some of the future things that I'm excited about related to mental health uh, in partnership with NIMH. So one is uh, our next module, survey module we'll be releasing is on mental health and well-being. And the goal here is to engage and, and derive more data related to mental health. Um, it's got 17 different domains in it, and you can see what some of those are and some of the sampling of what some of the instruments are. You know, we are trying uh, wherever possible to use standardized instruments. Uh, we already have, for instance, PHQ-9, GAD-7, and a number of these other kinds of instruments available uh, historically as well. So this will be added information on these that you could look at, you know, over time, for instance. Uh, and then we're launching an ancillary study with NIMH um, called Exploring the Mind. And this will provide more quantitative information uh, around uh, behavioral cognitive traits. Uh, it's five different modules you can see there um, that participants will be doing in a initially in a pilot form and we'll evaluate the data and then um, uh, see if there's any tweaks we need to make as, as we think about launching in a broader way. Um, so we're excited to have you know more of a cog uh, computational quantitative measure that we can um, provide uh, as well as kind of the survey uh, approach as well for this information. So um, I just want to end with uh, two call outs. You see the URLs there on the right. Anyone's welcome across the U.S. to join our program, joinallofus.org, and I welcome uh, many uh, as you and others to come in as researchers as well, researchallofus.org, and obviously the biggest thanks to our participants um, who are the foundation for all of it. So with that, I'll stop sharing and uh, I'm excited to engage in a conversation. Well, thanks, Josh. Thanks so much for that overview. I've got so many questions, uh, some of them uh, arcane scientific details. Um, but I'll try to try to rein myself in and 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 uh, and appeal to the broader audience today. Um, one of the things, of course, that puzzled me, and I'm sure is puzzling some of the listeners: How do you have data from 40 years ago if you're uh, launched just a couple of years back? So uh, tell us about that. Tell us how you have, you know, data on things like diagnoses and treatments, et cetera, that happened already decades ago. 
Great question. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. That's one of the exciting powers of electronic health record information, especially if people have been longitudinally engaged with a healthcare system for a long time. And some of the systems that are part of our network have had EHRs for a long time. And you can see that that even includes, you know, electronic prescribing information, laboratory results. Of course, billing codes is the most common element there. And some of them, you know, represent back, you know, decades. And um, that's a really powerful aspect. And the other thing that's exciting is uh, even the Fitbit data you can see goes back about a decade for some of our participants that they've been, you know, wearing Fitbits for, a long time. And there was actually a, a recent paper that came out in Nature Medicine that looked at um, number of steps per day on a, you know, phenome-wide investigation of different outcomes and uh, really was able to quantify prospectively, you know, how walking certain numbers of steps per day, you know, helps protect uh, against uh, risk of diabetes and obesity and uh, even uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, uh, you know, happening in the future. So you're able to do a lot of these by linking in and participants sharing those data with us. Right. So when you, you're saying when you, you're signing up, you then have the ability to give permission for all of us to collect your data going back uh, sometime. And, right. and, and that, pres, uh, that, that presents a tremendous opportunity for scientists. You know, naively, I'm thinking as you're accumulating those million people, this is going to be great because we're going to be able to learn things 20 years from now. And you're saying, no, we can learn things already, even if they happened 20 years ago, uh, based upon the data that you're, you're aggregating for, uh, for the scientific community. So that's fantastic. Look, the program has come so far uh, from, you point out, uh, 2014, when it was really just a germ of an idea. Um, but uh, what has it done for us lately? What are, you, what are you sort of most proud about in terms of accomplishments of all of us over the past year or so? Uh, you know, I think we're really on the front edge of that kind of work. The first papers that came out, so we released the the, the first insights into the researcher workbench uh, in 2020, where people could start doing work. And uh, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, initial investigations. Most have looked at health disparities. One of the ones that um, one note was looking at the... Uh, the so-called uh, Hispanic or Latino paradox of cardiovascular disease risk and showed that that didn't actually look to be true in our data. Um, I mentioned the one on the Fitbit data, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, you know, that 10,000 steps a day is, um, uh, is a metric we carry in our head and isn't actually, you know, based on a lot of science. It was based on the number of digits on the screen of, you know, the original pedometer that was used. Um, and, uh, you know, you see that there's uh, an inflection point that happens more around 8,000 steps per day uh, in the data. And, uh, you know, as, as a guy who, you know, practiced as an internist uh, for a number of years and how hard it was encouraged people to exercise, um, you know, one of the things that I was reassured by is, you know, there's a big effect if you can make someone go from 1,000 to 2,000 or 2,000 to 3,000 or 4,000 steps per day. You know, these small differences actually, you know, have in a, in a linear fashion, or sometimes even more than that, effect on, you know, risk of really important health outcomes. So that's an example. And so we uh, don't, we don't all have to go out and run a marathon. You're saying you don't all can, have to go out and run a marathon. walk around the block right. and that has tremendous benefits. That's right. That's exactly okay. right. Yeah. And then genomics, I think the genomics will be uh, really powerful on diverse populations yeah. because yeah. So, it's just so, not there. Yeah, so talk to me about that. So you've got a, a, a an instant population of what? You, how many thousands of of whole genome sequences? A hundred thousand now. A hundred thousand whole genome sequences. And is the plan to whole genome sequence the entire uh, all of us cohort if the, if people uh, want to be sequenced? That's right. So we're going to uh, sequence uh, a million. Wow, a million genomes. Now, uh, let's suppose that I want to look at depression. Depression is a fairly common illness. Something like 10 to 11% of individuals have depression at any one point in their lifetime, and the lifetime prevalence is, is probably higher than that. So uh, if I want to do, uh, if I wanted to know, does this um, collection have enough people with depression to do, I don't know, some whole genome sequence of, of study? Do, are we going to have that level of coverage or is it you know, going to be that these are all healthy people? You know, we have looked at the population incidences across a phenome-wide uh, set of diseases. Uh, this isn't published yet, but something that we've been looking at internally. 
compared to um, uh, estimates across the US population. And what we find is for common diseases, um, we are pretty close to national averages, but usually a little bit higher prevalence. And then as you get to rarer diseases, uh, we tend to uh, overrepresent those uh, more than you would expect nationally. Uh, so, you know, whatever the national prevalence is for most conditions, uh, we're usually a little bit higher for those. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would expect you could uh, you could do that. And, you know, I'll encourage everyone. I mentioned the data browser, databrowser.researchallofus.org. Uh, anyone can go in there right now. It works on your phone, you know, website, and just type in a condition and, and you'll see you know, instantly, you know, how many cases we have and, you know, the, the, the sex breakdown of those cases and um, uh, the age breakdown. And, and you can get some sense of what the, the exposures are. Um, another thing we're presenting this week at uh, ASHG um, from a, a, a a um, young scientist is, uh, is presenting work on um, looking at uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH uh, uh, in people who are exposed to SSRIs. So, you know, he did a genetic study on, you know, people that had SSRIs and had low sodium values, you know, and so there's already power to do that. And I feel like that he had about a thousand patients maybe in that study, just to give you a sense of all those things together. So a thousand people who happen to have SSRI, uh, SSRIs and sodium data enough for him to be able to, sorry, a thousand people who had this syndrome. You know, I'm, I, I'm going to start get fuzzy. Got to be more than a thousand now. people out of your yeah. 500,000 who are on SSRIs. Oh, right? way more. There's yeah, yeah, way, way more than a thousand. There must be a thousand who had this syndrome, I guess. I think this, it must be people yeah. that have this syndrome. Yeah, that's right. It must be cases. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. All right, we talked about genomics, but of course, genomics is fairly easy. We've done a pretty good job getting, you know, case the numbers of cases of individuals with schizophrenia or, you know, depression or whatever into the hundreds of thousands, right? But what's really hard for us is looking at environmental factors in mental illness and particular social determinants of health. And, and working that in because the numbers of different things to think about are so high and also unknown. Uh, and, and it's hard to get that sort of deep level data. What are the prospects of using all of us to address environmental factors in health in general and mental illness in particular? Josh, that's a great question. It's so important. And really one of the things we thought of as a foundation for our program, you know, I came from places where we had the diagnoses and, but, you know, we didn't have anything else. We had, we had the diet, sorry, we had the electronic health record, but that was it. And so you're limited to kind of know the full pictures of someone's health. So the, um, uh, during COVID, we launched um, two modules. One was this repeated measure that gets at some social determinants of health, and then a more comprehensive social determinants of health module that gathers a lot of those elements. And then at baseline, we get information like insurance status and income. And of course, we know some basics of, uh, you know, uh, how many people are in the household and things like that, um, as well as these deeper measures of resilience and optimism and um, uh, religious uh, preferences and engagement and um, uh, discrimination metrics. Um, and then uh, and then environment. So uh, with the current data set, uh, we have uh, ZIP3 uh, level geography, and that could- What, uh, what is ZIP3 be, level geography? All right, the first three digits of ZIP code. Okay. And gotcha. we continue, you know, this is an evolving process. So nothing is a stop. We're, um, uh, you know, we're really uh, committed to protecting the privacy of our individuals and also figuring out models where we can bring in more and more environmental data. So we've uh, actually linked in um, uh, you know, the initial American community survey data, uh, we intend to link in a lot more um, uh, environmental data over time. Uh, we've been working with uh, NIHS with that, and we had a workshop to get ideas. Uh, we may look at, you know, linkages. We may also look at things that we measure directly from the biospecimens we have uh, as well in that. So um, there's a lot of data. How, do you have a number? How, how many petabytes is it right now? Oh, Yeah. I'll be wrong. Um, I know, it's least, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, at some point in 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 the recent past, I think it was uh, seven petabytes, but it's uh, it's definitely bigger than that. So this, this is not going to fit on your local hard drive on your laptop. That's right. <laughs> Where does it live? 
So it lives in the cloud. We uh, use Amazon and Google Cloud uh, services. The, the data analysis right now is all in Google Cloud. Um, and the researcher workbench lives there. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's really a great example of how we can use these centralized resources to both empower researchers and accelerate research and make it, you know, more democratized into who can do research, as well as provide better protection. You know, we can centralize the protection instead of everyone downloading the data and uh, provide more on-ramps into it. So one of the things that's exciting, I just want to tell you one story that I find really compelling. One of the first GWASs I did across a network um, uh, was part of called the Emerge Network was we looked at type 2 diabetes. Five sites uh, found people in the electronic health record, uh, pulled together our array genotyping data of about a million loci. Um, actually, it was less than that, and uh, did that. And it took us about three years, honestly, to do this. And, you know, we had our own bespoke built expensive computing systems to do that, that we had to pull together. And, you know, not everyone could do that. And, you know, uh, I had a uh, data scientist replicate this experiment on our platform, and he did the whole thing, uh, soup to nuts, while actually doing some other things during that time in three days. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, three years to three point and clicked and yeah. uh, pointed and clicked that GWAS, I think cost $37 to run. Um, uh, people, by the way, start off with $300 of compute credits. So, you know, it could be done for free. So that was, um, that was my next question actually is, is about resourcing the research, right? So I know that you've put out some calls recently for applications to study, uh, to do, do studies in the all of us ecosystem. Uh, and that we're working with you, other institutes are working with you on figuring out how to, how to get our investigators. What's the plan? So you've, you've already said there are some central resources. You get a certain amount of compute time for free. How are we going to get people to, uh, how are we going to resource investigators to be able to come in and do what they want to do with this data? That's great. So every new researcher that comes on gets those initial $300 of compute credits. And uh, you mentioned some of the things we've already had in place. And so, um, uh, you know, we are looking at ways we continue to do this um, and move this forward. I certainly encourage uh, people to come on and use those initial credits and put it in their grants um, in the future to, you know, uh, include that as a component and enabling. And then what we hope to do over time is even thinking of, especially about those who would be under-resourced and things like that. How can we better support them? And those are things we're actively thinking about as well. Okay. I'll note there's a few questions coming in in the Q&A. Please keep them coming in. I'm going to turn to those in just a moment. Uh, but first, I want to um, ask one more question of you myself, Josh. What are you excited? I asked you what, what you're most excited about, what you're most proud of, what you've done in the last year. What's coming in the next year? What are you most excited about that's on the horizon? So there'll be another data release. And uh, that data release will take our genome count. Uh, we don't know the exact number, but it'll be uh, certainly above 200,000 whole genomes. Wow. Um, so and, and it, so it'll, it'll more than double, easily more than double the number of genomes that we have available in that data set with, of course, the same diversity mix. And so that will just really, um, really up the power to do some of these kinds of analyses. Cool. All right. So looking forward to a next data release, more genomics, more, I'd imagine, data of all sort, different sorts. Oh, yeah. and releases. We'll more, more of everything. More of everything. Yep. And really, uh, and we're already starting to see some of the amazing results that you can get uh, in in the all of us space. I'm going to turn to some questions from the uh, from the viewing audience. Again, keep them coming into the Q and A if you'd like. Um, and then uh, after those questions, maybe we'll turn to mental health for a bit, and we'll talk about uh, what what we're trying to do together. Uh, let's see. Um, how are you handling the confidentiality issues? Uh, for example, about genetic risk data, about insurance and insurance companies, um, and uh, and what are your views on on what we need to do in that space, confidentiality moving forward? Uh, let's start with genomics on this question. So, uh, one of the things that's important, and we thought about from the beginning, is you know someone doesn't have to get genetic results back if they don't want to, and not everyone does. And so one of the things we do is we have an educational process in that and tell them of the risks. You know, right now, uh, uh, GINA protects us for health insurance, but not life uh, and disability. So we, we educate on that component. 
um, uh, and tell them what the potential risks are. You know, we don't actually, uh, I'm certainly not a lawyer, uh, but uh, we don't actually know what all the risks of those are. I've certainly anecdotally know people that have had uh, found things on stories, then their health, and their life, I'm sorry, their life insurance didn't care that they had such genetic results, but that doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that that is universal. So we educate on that process. Um, and uh, try to let them know more about what that looks like. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, things like privacy around electronic health records and stuff like that, you know, uh, it is it's always important to say that, you know, our protection of that privacy and securing the data is really job one because, you know, we have to begin with trust and, and really engender trust in all ways. And some of that's, you know, telling people and letting them know we're going to protect our data. So, you know, it's, it's certainly a rigorous security process, um, uh, certificates of confidentiality to protect against uh, law enforcement access, for instance, is an important uh, thing we have to we talk about, um, as well as all these just the data security stuff. And then we're up front that, you know, uh, you know, we can't promise there'll never be a data breach, but we're going to work as hard as we can. And we'll certainly let you know if there's any, if we notice anything like that. And and, and we look at the, you know, the research projects and we have certain rules about, you know, what kind of research projects can be done. It's pretty expansive, but, you know, there are some things that we watch out for, especially what would be potentially stigmatizing research. Great. So you, you care about it both from the perspective of safeguarding the data itself from outside intruders, but also from the perspective of what researchers do with that data. Exactly. Okay. Uh, this question sort of follows up on a question that I asked about moving beyond uh, genomic data. Besides genome sequencing analysis, uh, what else can you do? Can you do combination analyses such as uh, comparing mental status uh, and physical conditions? Um, or, you know, what else What else can you do in, in the context of, of these data sets? You know, uh, there are so many emergent studies I think people can think of. Uh, I will never ever be able to think of them all. And uh, you know, I think uh, yes, there you can do almost all sorts of things. So think about any of these data streams. You know, five hundred, uh, you know, million health related data points at this point over you know decades of information uh, plus you know uh, the Fitbit data plus genomics um, plus how you could link in new environmental data. That you could bring in and link, link in or stuff that will come. These include surveys across mental health, some of them repeated measures. Uh, you can look at changes of substance use uh, before and after the pandemic. Um, you um, could look at uh, interactions of uh, physical with mental health, uh, depression with um, race and ethnicity and how uh, prior existent uh, exposure to a cardiovascular medication like a beta blocker with and without depression uh, pre uh, extant in their medical record. You could come up with all sorts of combinations. And those and that, are just- That's all the, what you just thought of at the top of your head in these- That's just what I thought of the top of the head. I mean, it's, it's rich there, data streams. You can combine them however you want. Um, and you said there's the something guideline. like- Right. And there's something like how many thousands of investigators are already working with the data, thinking of creative things to do? Yeah. It's about 3,500 now. 3,500 now. It's fantastic. All right. There are two different questions that really get at combining the data resources that all of us aggregates with exterior services. So one of them, for example, is uh, can you, are there plans to perform genotype imputation, which apparently, and this is beyond me, uh, the best imputation panel is top med. And obviously that's not in your research portfolio. So that's one, it's a very specific question. And another question is, can your information uh, capture or be used uh, with uh, data that say collects around peer support services? Or that I was thinking about if someone, if, if people are using, you know, these uh, apps that provide, you know, talk-based psychotherapy, any, but really the, the question is how much can we use, how much is all of us really, it's isolated ecosystem, how much are we going to be able to combine what's going on in all of us with uh, other data streams or processing streams? Yeah. So I'll take the, the first question is kind of pretty direct. And then the second question is really exciting as we think about, you know, where we could go. So the first question, uh, you know, I'll just remind the audience that, we are generating sequence and array data. And you know, the imputation process is most relevant for the array data. Right now we have more arrays than sequences, but um, you know, they'll rapidly catch up. And so with this next release, they'll be tighter, they'll be closer. And so uh, you know, there's really not a 
most people are using sequence data, not the array data. And, and so we imagine that to be happening. So we are not actually centrally imputing the array data. You know, we've observed directly, you know, directly sequenced 600 million variants um, of, of, you know, variation at this point already, right? Which is way more than you could ever impute um, off of an array backbone. Uh, we are looking at creating an imputation server um, and what that would look like because we have such a diverse panel and we're going to grow, you know, so big and large that we think it could be beneficial to do that. And whether we can, you know, add that or collaborate with TopMed and, and maybe even create a, you know, learn from both of our experiences, um, I will certainly think about. And then, um, uh, and we think about the second question. Uh, you know, we are, um, uh, think of ourselves as a platform right now. You know, it's it's stuff that we're doing and generating, but as we think about going forward, uh, we really wanna develop a rich portfolio of what, we, what we're calling ancillary studies. These are things that we're going to build on top of us as a platform, and that's what exploring the mind is. It's one of these ancillary studies that, in partnership with you, and we'll be thinking. You know, it's a novel technology for us. You know, this idea of an interactive kind of module that that gives something out of it. And so, uh, you know, may, I don't know what's in the future of those ancillary studies. We have another big one called Nutrition for Precision Health, which is going to do. Uh, for instance, they have uh, one of the cool parts of that where they're going to have people take pictures of their food, and it's going to develop you know AI ML algorithms to like figure out like you know, what people are eating and what the caloric content of it is and stuff like that based on other metrics, you know, as well as looking at like the microbiome. So, um, you know, the, the, the future possibilities are really close to endless with what we'll be able to do. And so well, let's have those conversations over time. Well, well thanks. I'm, I'll turn down, um, I'm, I'm going to ask some more questions of my own, but uh, please folks keep the Q and A's coming in as, as you think of them. Uh, I, I want to, uh, Turn our attention to sort of the the goal of of what uh, of what all of us at least it initially was, and I think I think it still is right, and it is precision medicine. So we've talked about this data that you have and the wonderful questions that you can ask, and uh, the tremendous genomics resource is going to be the ability to understand uh, social determinants, other environmental factors leading to disease. Um, our own studies, like you mentioned, to try to uh, you know dissect behavior on a large scale and really. Uh, link that to health. But if we think moving forward about precision medicine, about affecting our ability to really design uh, uh, treatments, make treatment decisions for individual patients, how does all this data get us there? And can you see some uh, you know, near-term stuff that, that, that might be illustra illustrative of, uh, of that? Yeah. You know, I think of this as going, I'm so glad you asked this question and focused us um, towards some of these directions. I think, you know, I see two streams of information coming out of this that, that will actually help. And one that may be less thought of, I'll mention first is, you know, we are directly offering participants the chance to get, you know, personal genomic information that has an impact for their health that they can take to their providers around these inherited, you know, cancer and cardiac and things like that conditions. Um, as well as pharmacogenomics. And by the way, 96% of people across all ancestries, they're different variants, uh, different you know, medications that will be affected, but it's basically 96% across ancestries will have a pharmacogenetic variant that would alter you know, what drug would be recommended if they were uh, you know, prescribed that drug uh, or a drug in that class. So, you know, um, uh, so these kind of things across a national population with people like walking in across, you know, all backgrounds and, and, and geographies um, to their health providers with these reports, you know, I hope it has kind of a secular benefit of, of, you know, getting a broad range of doctors thinking about precision medicine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with their patients. And so it could have this uh, effect of, you know, education and, and um, awareness um, uh, in a, you know, in a large way. Um, so that's, that's something that maybe isn't maybe quite as obvious um, as a indirect effect of our program. The more direct effect would be, you know, the studies that are done on these populations and what we'll end up learning about, you know, variants that aren't in European backgrounds as, a, as an early win that help us understand pathogenicity and risk in things like Mendelian or non, you know, Mendelian disease across different populations and studies of those things. I mentioned, uh, and then a bunch of epidemiological things you can imagine as well. Yeah, I want to focus in for a moment on that diversity in genomics thing. This has been a really um, important area that we've recognized uh, for mental health. 
uh, as well as, of course, you know, other areas of genetics and genomics. You know, in addition to identifying new variants, apparently, and uh, this is what I've learned from my colleagues here at NIMH, who are the genomics experts, it also lets you find map existing variants better, right? Because we uh, uh, folks of one and uh, genetic ancestry are going to have one set of what we call haplotypes or, or blocks of variants that all go together. And folks from different ancestral variances will have either smaller ones or different ones that enable you to then dissociate the disease risk from a whole long block of variants that are all linked in one ancestry to really get it down finer. And for mental health anyway, that's incredibly important because what we have now is not really hundreds of genes, for example, that are linked for schizophrenia. We have hundreds of loci, hundreds of places, and diversifying the genetic ancestry of our data will really help us get from places to genes. And you know, that's why I'm, 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 I'm tantalized by 200,000 genomes. That's, that's pretty damn uh, exciting. Um, tempered by the fact that probably, you know, even if it's population risk, uh, less than 1% of individuals in those 200,000 will have schizophrenia. But it's important to recognize that for more common illnesses, we are talking about a tremendous advantage uh, by diversifying, diversifying the genetic data. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, uh, let's delve into the precision medicine piece a little bit longer. Um, uh, you touched on this somewhat in what you were talking about, but I'd, I'd love to hear from you. What, what's your definition of precision <laughs> medicine? How would you define it? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, briefly comment, you know, at Vanderbilt, uh, I had one of my titles was vice president of personalized medicine, and I led a center for precision medicine. <laughs> um, so, 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 so I'll just, um, uh, uh, you know, talk about the intersection of those things, because, you know, uh, for a while we used a lot of the term personalized medicine. And, uh, you know, I like to argue that doctors probably always have tried to do personalized medicine. I don't think any, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to say 20 years ago, I wasn't trying to be personalized with my patients um, uh, in, in their care, right? So, so I think precision medicine is about layering a dimensionality of data that you may not be able to observe or, you know, sort of cognitively keep in your head um, uh, directly in your care of the patient in a personalized way. So I think, I think, it, I think that's the, that's the, arc that you get in personalization with precision that you may not have had before. It's got lots of other implications, more exact diagnoses, um, uh, you know, sort of getting beyond maybe type one and type two diabetes to lots of subtypes or thinking about, you know, the many uh, factors that may influence depression, which includes even factors like getting that med right the first time, even just from a side effect perspective, you know, as well as hopefully treatment perspective as well. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that characterization a lot. I, I think nowhere in medicine are we more personalized than in psychiatry, right? Where we really delve deeply into uh, people's pasts, uh, people's presence, the particular symptoms they happen to have. Um, but uh, what we lack in, in, in that, uh, even though we might try to personalize our treatment approaches, our evidence-based approaches to use that information to guide treatment selection. So uh, we can understand our patients deeply uh, by personalizing our information about them, but then turning that understanding into uh, in a practice. Um, well, I think the, the psychodynamic psychotherapists might argue that that's what they do all the time. But in terms of evidence-based approaches to say, if you find X, then you do Y. That's what we really need uh, need mm -hmm. some work. And that's, you know, you mentioned our efforts around characterizing behavior and cognition in all of us uh, folks with the um, uh, 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 with this new uh, ancillary study that that we're uh, that you're helping us with, and that it's really been a, a pleasure to work with your people to get it up and going. That's what it's about. It's about trying to get deeper information about our patients from a behavioral and cognitive perspective and really ask the question whether we can then provide an evidence base for making treatment decisions using that additional depth of phenotyping. So I, I appreciate you bringing us into that into that space, both uh, with your definition of personalized versus precision medicine and also uh, by facilitating our work together. Um, I'm going to turn back to some uh, questions from the audience now, and we do have about 10 minutes left. So if folks want to get in the last minute questions, please put them in. Um, 
Uh, here's a, a very practical one, uh, but an important one for those of us who already have a workbench account and workspace. Fantastic. Glad that you have it. Uh, wonderful to see uh, some of our MH folks uh, who are, are working the space. If we move to another institution, are we able to transfer the account and workspace over or do we have to start from scratch? Have you figured oh, wow. that one out yet? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. Um, uh, I, I I can guess what I think it is, but what I would say is that's a question to you know click on the little uh, info boxes uh, to you know ask a question to the audience to make sure or sorry through the system to make sure I would get the right answer. Right. So <laughs> because, there's there's places people can get help with those that's kinds exactly of questions. Exactly right. Yep, gotcha. yep. So when you're in there, uh, even before you're logged in, there's uh, on the bottom right, you can provide feedback. Uh, when you're logged in, there's um, uh, under the uh, the menu, there's an option to contact us. And I just encourage you to do that directly. And that way you'd get the right answer. And you must be learning things all the time about what your system can and can't do. That's right. Kind of feedback, That's right. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How many people work at, uh, at all of us right now? <laughs> It's always hard to know exactly what that. I know. Is. I have the same yeah. thing in an IMA. So you give me an uh, estimate, uh, no one will know better anyway. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we have a probably uh, within the the NIH team, we have uh, I think a upwards of two hundred people probably right now. And then across the consortium, there's probably if you look at our list, that would combine them and us, um, uh, close to three thousand. Wow. Yeah. Most of that's going to be enrollment. But, you know, yeah. our EHR team that was curating and collating and putting these things in, uh, you know, common data models and stuff, that that email list that went out for that team <laughs> at one point was around 200 people um, across all the sites that were, you know, pulling their individual sites. We had some sites when we started this thing that had, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheets for EHRs that they, that they had to, like, you know, sort of uh, pull together. So there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of benefit uh, locally as well. Like people said, you know, this was painful at the beginning, but we're really glad. Like this helps us operationally <laughs> as well. Well, that that raises uh, a, a question that in, in my mind, you know, like you must have faced all kinds of challenges in uh, uh, in in yeah. making in in bringing this all uh, to fruition. And I, I wonder if you might share with one one that sticks in your mind as being. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly interesting or poignant. Well, you know, I think you always have hats that you wear to get a goal done that you didn't necessarily think you would be wearing. One of those was reading all the uh, legal agreements that went back and forth with mm -hmm. we had and, and uh, security agreements. And we had about when I was at Vanderbilt, um, uh, we had about a hundred of these. And, um, you know, really having to carefully, you know, kind of think about that. Um, you know, a big aha for us was how we manage the um, consents in a way that would be understandable to everyone coming in all these different ways. And also, um, you know, not, uh, we use a HIPAA right of authorization, which means the participant is saying, I want you to give your health information to all of us to do work. And, you know, that flip of how we did it, I think is really empowering too. It's, 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 um, uh, it's a right of access, you know, approach from the participant to direct it somewhere else. And that's a much more powerful thing than trying to do it with, with consent. Um, and uh, uh, so those are just a couple of observations. I already talked about the harmonization thing. I'll just say our, in, when we wrote the blueprint for this back in 2015, what it could look like, we, um, I thought we were pretty ambitious and, uh, you know, it's exciting to me that we have gone further than what, you know, we uh, wrote out in terms of like what we could harmonize, pull together, centralize, um, make available um, and the participant population we could recruit. I mean, I think our, you know, I'm really proud of the t work that the engagement partners and the and the healthcare provider organizations and all these groups that have you know engaged diverse communities and you know help build and win trust of diverse partners who you know um, uh, have good reason to not always be uh, completely trusting of us um, uh, without us doing the work to you know prove ourselves. Great. Okay, so you mentioned Nashville, and and I want to. So are you still in Nashville? Are you in Nashville right now? 
I'm in, Beth well, right now I'm in Los Angeles, but um, <laughs> I, I live in Bethesda. Yeah. You live in Bethesda. So you moved, you made the move to DC. I moved, yep. And how has the uh, pandemic been treating you? <laughs> um, you know, it was the hardest on our kids. Uh, I mentioned yeah. I have four kids and, and uh, moving and then immediately basically going virtual. So um, they wanted to move back to Nashville uh, yeah. <laughs> during most of the pandemic uh, for sure. But uh, it's better now. Schools in session, you know, sports, uh, all that stuff. That's helpful. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, listen, Josh, I want to thank you really tremendously, not only for uh, joining us here today, but being for being such an excellent partner with NIMH. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the work we've been able to get done together. And we're looking forward to being able to open up the workspace to our researchers uh, there was one final question. I, I think you told us this, but uh, but since someone asked, I'll go ahead and ask it, which is how do how do I get access to the researcher workbench? Where do I go to sign up? Awesome. Researchallofus.org. And Research. you'll see on the top right, a register button, and it'll take you through the steps. Researchallofus.org, register, and then all of a sudden you have access to hundreds of thousands of data points, actually billions of data points, hundreds of thousands of Brilliant. genomic resources. Uh, and um, and I have done a little bit of, of playing around with the, uh, not the researcher workbench, but the public facing part. And I know that uh, just like Josh suggested, there is a good representation of individuals with various mental illnesses there, uh, including schizophrenia and uh, depression and anxiety disorders at rates that are around or better than the overall rate I shouldn't say better than, higher than or the overall rate in the general population. And so uh, it really is uh, going to be a tool, a resource for precision psychiatry in addition to precision medicine. And so uh, we're really excited to be able to uh, support scientists to get into this data and, and teach us new things. Thanks for joining us, though, today, Josh. I really appreciate the overview gave the opportunity for us to chat and uh, for you to field questions from our audience. Uh, let me thank everyone who came. Uh, at one point, there were uh, uh, close to 200 folks uh, on the webinar, which is really great. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing many of you at our next uh, NIMH Directors Innovation Series uh, event. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure being on here, and I really appreciate the excellent partnership with NIMH. It's been great. And I do think I do think this is the first time I've had a Josh on the on the program. So. <laughs> First Sorry. time being interviewed by Josh. There you go. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. That concludes today's session. You may now disconnect.